My name is Amy Cardall. I'm the Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Breast Cancer Network. I'm also a member. And um, tonight's uh, presentation is very, uh, it's very special to me. It's very important. Um, I have, I do not myself have stage four breast cancer, but I certainly have known and loved a lot of people who do. And um, this is a mission that is really close to my heart, making sure that breast cancer awareness includes metastatic breast cancer awareness. So we're very fortunate tonight to have Dr. Tracy O'Connor here as our main speaker. But first, I'm actually going to introduce Teresa Leatherbarrow, who is a member of our board of directors as well and attends our Living with Metastatic Breast Cancer support group. So Teresa, I'll let you take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, as Amy said, my name is Teresa Leatherbarrow. Um, I'm 45 years old. But I was first diagnosed with early stage breast cancer when I was 34. It was three years after having my third child. Um, and uh, I was 34. I was actually a year younger than when you start getting screened with mammograms. And I had felt a lump, not even on my breast. It was actually on the right side under my arm. And it was like, a, it felt like a little kernel of popcorn before it's popped. And um, so my primary, oh, it's probably nothing, but you should probably go see your OBGYN. Saw my OBGYN, he was, you know, he had delivered all three of my kids. He said, oh, it's probably nothing, you're way too young, you've been having pregnancies, like, but either way, like, let's have you get a mammogram. Mammogram didn't pick anything up. So, um, but he could feel it and I could feel it and it didn't feel right to either of us. So I had an ultrasound. And they were like, doesn't seem quite right. Let's do a biopsy. And um, even waiting for the results of the biopsy, the nurse saying it's probably nothing. Like you're really too young for this. Um, it wasn't. It was. It was cancer. And I was told at that appointment that, you know, unfortunately you do have early stage cancer. Um, so I, I went to Roswell for a second opinion, and I'm glad that I chose to. Um, Received my care at Rothwell going forward, and my doctor is Dr. Lafine. So I was treated for early stage cancer. I followed all the recommendations from my uh, surgeon and my oncologist. I was put on tamoxifen, went back to work, and went back to live my life. And I did that for no problems for a good seven years. And then at age 40, I started having bone pain on my left. Uh, hip and femur. That's weird. I feel like that's too young to have arthritis. So I went back to my primary. It was really interfering with me being able to run and walk and exercise because I've always been really active. And um, she, she's like, well, it's probably bursitis. So I was treated for bursitis and was given like two or three rounds of cortisone shots. But it wasn't bursitis. And when they went back and checked the x-rays a second time, they realized that it was metastatic lesions on the bone. And I said to the doctor, does that have anything to do with breast cancer by any chance? And they had to go back and like, oh, you had breast cancer. And that's when like the whole mood of the room changed, you know, the party kind of ended. And um, you know, I was I quickly learned within probably a week that I had gone on to join one of the 166,000 U.S. Americans living with breast cancer that spreads beyond the breast. So I actually don't go around saying I have metastatic breast cancer. I just say I have breast cancer because I think it's really important for women to understand that it is the same disease. For the majority of women, the, the chemistry stays the same. I mean, sometimes, sometimes it can change. But for me, the, the chemistry of the new tumor site was the same as the original site. So um, that was 2017. 
um, almost five years later this summer, right? And I just wanted to let you know that like, um, maybe, maybe by me being here and speaking and just telling a little bit of my story helps you to, to sort of rethink what it might mean to live with breast cancer. It's something I live with. I always preface breast cancer by saying I'm living with that. I think that that's really important. I think words matter. I don't call myself a survivor. I don't call myself a thriver. Some people do, and if that works well for you, that's fine. I'm just someone living day to day trying to get through life because life can be really hard and really great at the same time. So back then, I didn't really know what to expect. It seems really, um, really devastating. I had three young children, um, but since then, I've been able to see two of my kids graduate high school and go into college. My youngest, who was only three years old when I was first diagnosed back at age 34, is now 14, and will be starting her sophomore year of high school. And um, I'm really active. I live an active, healthy life. Um, I've made lots of healthy ch uh, changes, obviously, but um, I just hope to sort of change your perception a little bit about what it means to live with breast cancer. I definitely don't want anyone's daddy, that's for damn sure. <laughs> um, so I did talk to some of the girls in my breast cancer group that I attend here at BCN, and we wanted to ask or uh, share with you some of the things that we would want you to know about what it's like to live with an advanced cancer, because in most parts of the world, it's just called advanced cancer. Here in the United States, we focus on the metastatic title, but in most parts of the world, it's just called advanced cancer. And basically what we want you to know is that if you are someone that receives that diagnosis, that you're not alone. There's lots of support available as I, as I shared and one of about 166,000 um, Americans and that's men and women. Um, another thing I think it's important for you to know and hopefully that, you know, I'm showing it is that you can have a diagnosis and not be sick and not look sick. And that can change from day to day. I don't consider myself sick. As I said before, words matter to me. I always say I am well. I always say I am well, because I believe in manifesting how you want to be. Um, but there are times where I have good days and bad. There's days where I might be taking a nap in the middle of the day. There's days where I might not be getting out of bed, depending on what my treatment looks like that day, week, month, or year. Um, if you are someone living with metastatic breast cancer in the breast cancer community, you are still considered a survivor. You're not some stepchild that has to be like hidden away because the breast cancer community does consider you a survivor from the day of your diagnosis, whatever that cancer diagnosis may be. Um, as I showed before, it's really important for, for me to have you understand that it's not a different cancer or not the others. Um, it's in no way something that I want you to be fearful of because I don't want you to say, oh, we don't want to talk about that word because you know, that's not going to happen to me. We don't know what will happen to you and I don't know what will happen to me. Um, other than we all make worms in the end, right? So we just have to live each day the best as we can, and um, that's what I'm here to do. I'm here to live well as long as I can and as well as I can. But it is important that we share about metastatic breast cancer with everyone, including people who have had an experience with cancer in the past. Very little money does go to breast cancer research toward metastatic disease. Um, it's like between five and seven percent of all your pink ribbon crap that goes to actual metastatic disease research. So that's one reason I became involved here at UCI. And I'm really proud of their dedication to helping fund research um, designated for metastatic research, which is helping with clinical trials and treatments that improve our quality of life. Um, Another thing that um, my girls in our group that we want to share with you is that we all kind of agreed that we wish we would have known about some symptoms. When I presented to my primary with 
pain in my hip and leg. There was no connection made, not by me, nor the physician, that it could be related to cancer. And so I'm hoping that perhaps Dr. O'Connor will touch on that a little bit tonight, and if not, we'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Um, just a couple other considerations that maybe we'll have time to talk about afterwards. Um, but Dr. O'Connor will, I'm sure, explain that there are many treatments available for advanced breast cancer, but there's not a cure. So if you do come across someone who shares with you that they are living with an advanced stage disease, please be mindful about asking them how long you will be in treatment. So that's a touchy question. I'm hopeful it'll be a really long time because I'm hopeful I will live a long time. But I'm also really hopeful that maybe they'll find something so that I won't have to be in treatment any longer. Um, what's your prognosis? Not a nice question. It's the same. Okay? And that's really important. From the moment we are born into this world, our prognosis is the same. And then, um, and this is just a personal one. This is just speaking for me, from I. Please don't tell me how you think I look today, unless I've asked you, okay? Because that's a hard thing. Um, you know, you don't know if I am wearing a wig or not. You don't know um, if I had chemo that morning or not. Um, sometimes I'm tired just because I have three kids and they're tiring. And they're even harder when they're in college and they're when they were great. <laughs> so, you know, I think that's just a thing to be mindful, especially women. We just need to, we need to drop the whole how we look thing. And I have two teenage girls, so that's really important to me. We don't talk about how we look in our house. And um, the other main thing is to drop any judgment or assumption that I did something to cause it. Right? Because ooh, I wonder if she didn't do everything her doctor told her to do. I did. I did everything my doctor told me to do. And it's just, you know, that's just the card I was dealt. And that's okay because it was one shitty card, but I've got a lot of really good cards too. Okay. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tracy O'Connor. Um, Dr. O'Connor is an associate professor at the Department of Medicine at Roswell Park. She's also the associate professor of clinical medicine at the Jacobs School at UB. Her education is from the School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences from the State University of New York and Northwestern University. And Dr. O'Connor did her residency at Crown Memorial Hospital, the University of Rochester Medical School. So Dr. O'Connor works at Roswell Park along with my physician, Dr. Levine. She is certified in internal medicine and oncology. And her special interests are novel treatments for breast cancer, psychological impact of breast cancer, and supportive care therapies for patients with advanced disease. And um, from time to time, I'll search to see what type of clinical trials and research studies Roswell's doing, specific for metastatic breast cancer. And I'm very pleased and proud to see that Dr. O'Connor, along with Dr. Levine's name, pops up regularly for a new study or, pro or program that they're working on. So with that, I want to turn it over to Dr. O'Connor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, when I talked to Amy um, about this topic, we talked a little bit about talking in general about metastatic disease, the development of metastatic disease, what people should be looking for. So that's really where I aimed this discussion, but to try to delve into the treatment of each individual subtype of metastatic cancer, I think it would be pretty overwhelming, um, but I'm happy to talk at the end about any questions or individual things that come up. It's a pleasure to do that. Um, so what does it mean to have a metastatic or stage four breast cancer? This is really basic. I start very basic and you can get as deep as you want. Um, but metastatic means that the cancer has spread beyond the breast and immediate lymph node base ends to other organs and tissues, such as the bone, soft tissues like lymph nodes throughout the body that are not in that local regional area, lungs, liver, and brain are some of the most common sites that we see. Even though the cancer has moved to a different organ or place, it is still treated as a breast cancer. 
So breast cancer involving the bone is treated as a breast cancer. It's not a bone cancer. That's a common um, misunderstanding that we hear in clinic. There was an updated statistic here. I rounded it off, but clearly, would you say 166,000 women in the United yeah. States are living with uh, metastatic breast cancer currently? And men can also be affected, but that's much more rare. One of the things that I wanted to bring up, because especially as people are getting more and more quick um, results online, things popping up on their phone, there can be a lot of misunderstanding between the terms metastatic stage four and advanced breast cancer. So most of us use stage four and metastatic cancer interchangeably. Those two terms generally mean the same thing to us, but it's important to recognize that advanced can also mean locally advanced. It doesn't always mean metastatic. So if you have a good deal of disease in the breast and the lymph nodes, local, regionally, um, it can be called advanced. And it's important to clarify if you hear the word advanced, whether or not it's a distant metastatic or locally advanced. So that metastatic disease involving the superclub super nodes, the axilla, um, and especially intramammary nodes is not stage four disease, even though you will see that word on pathology reports and radiology reports. So the word metastatic and the word advanced, they don't always mean stage four, and sometimes you've got to dig a little deeper to get to that point. When does it appear? As we heard from uh, Teresa, everyone is different. Um, I want to emphasize that most patients that we treat in the clinic are fortunate and they do not develop metastatic breast cancer. But if it does happen, it occurs months or years after a person is treated for her initial breast cancer most of the time. Um, that depends a bit on subtype. So women that are treated for triple, women or men that are treated for triple negative breast cancer are more likely to have a recurrence two to three years after their initial diagnosis, where women that have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, if God forbid it's going to recur, it tends to do so later, five to seven years after diagnosis. Very, very late reoccurrence can also happen. Those individuals usually had large primary tumors and or a great deal of axillary disease. I've had women recur as far as 30 years out after their original diagnosis. It's still a similar tumor. There's a lot that we don't understand about what's called tumor dormancy or what allows a breast cancer to sort of lie in wait in a distant tissue for decades before it begins to grow again. Melanoma is another cancer that commonly can do that. And we have a lot to learn about it because obviously you can imagine that's very difficult to study. Um, some patients learn when they have metastatic breast cancer when they're first diagnosed. That's called de novo metastatic breast cancer. It's not particularly common. It's only 6% of women in the United States. About 8% of men um, are diagnosed with de novo metastatic disease, largely because there's less awareness um, in the male patients than there is in women. So they usually have a more delayed diagnosis. What are the symptoms? We just heard from Teresa talk about um, some of the symptoms that she experienced prior to uh, diagnosis. And it varies depending on where the cancer cells have spread. So some of the things that um, breast cancer patients on surveillance should be wary of or aware of is symptoms of bony metastasis. Often it's pretty severe and progressive pain. It doesn't tend to come and go away for long periods of time. It tends to come and stay. Um, pain is most frequently seen in the back in the ribs and in the long bones. She, you mentioned your leg. Mm -hmm. um, that's a pretty common presentation. Liver metastasis can occur. People can have abdominal pain, weight loss without trying, um, appetite loss, notice a change in the color of their urine or the background of their eyes. It's called jaundice. And lung metastasis can cause a chronic cough and shortness of breath. Um, Brain metastasis, you know, you know, you can very severe headaches or weird neurologic findings, changing, you know, face um, symmetry, weakness. Um, these things are all important to know. One of the things that I just want to say, and it's just really a, a plea for everybody, is that as medicine has changed, I mean, in the past 20 years since I've been treating breast cancer patients, a lot has changed. And the part about medicine that's changed that I don't particularly care for is how volumes are such and doctors are not hired at the correct level, in my opinion, to do follow-up of patients. So patients are followed up in a variety of different settings. It's always important to remember and make sure that you remind the people caring for you that you have a history of breast cancer. 
because I see too many people who've developed a cough and have been treated for months and months and months and nobody ever thought, gee, she's a breast cancer survivor. And my goodness, she had six positive nodes you know, 15 years ago. Breast cancer can do all kinds of things. So if there's an unexplained symptom or something that is persistent, um, it's important to remind the people caring for you of the history and or call the people that treated you in the first place. Um, because as we're getting more and more crowded, even at places like Roswell, we've got good survivorship clinic. There's you know, a good place to be followed, but it's not always with the people that treated you and know all of your history and remember um, how you presented. So patients with metastatic breast cancer are primarily treated with systemic treatments or drugs that work throughout the body, chemotherapy, targeted drugs, and hormonal therapy. Sometimes radiation is used to treat pain or to slow growth of a tumor in a certain area. Um, surgery is rarely used in stage four disease. Um, I'll show you an example where sometimes we do consider it when it's for palliation or trying to prevent uh, skin breakdown. Sometimes we use surgery to help stabilize bones, um, but unfortunately removing metastatic sites is generally not an option um, that works very well where good systemic therapy tends to work better. It is important, a lot of patients don't want to get a biopsy if they develop metastatic disease because it's have another thing to go through and we all hate procedures, but it is so important to get a biopsy of that distant site when it occurs, if it's possible without putting you at risk, um, because we want to repeat the biomarkers and these can dictate treatment as well as doing a lot of just additional genomic testing on the tumor to make sure that we understand um, how best to treat an individual. So when we do a biopsy of a site in the breast or somewhere else, the first thing that happens is the pathologist looks through the microscope. This is an example of a high-grade invasive buccal carcinoma. So these are, these are the cancer cells here on the right, and these are the cells that are going to be tested um, for the various biomarkers. So hormone receptors are really important, uh, obviously, in breast cancer biology because hormone-positive breast cancers have um, both targets for therapy and the presence or and degree of hormone receptor positivity also predicts how well people respond to antiestrogen therapy. So we look at estrogen receptors as a very important uh, marker linked with regulation of certain genes, particularly those controlling cell growth and allows us to use targeted therapies to address these cancers. Um, when those cancer cells are stained, this is what you see. So on the left is the estrogen receptor, on the right is the progesterone receptor, and the positivity are these dark cells showing that they have receptors present on them. HER2 is another important um, stain, both immunohistochemistry, which is illustrated here on the right, or by FISH, um, fluorescent and sexual hybridization, which is in slide B. And this helps us look to see if the gene is amplified and thereby allows us to use um, anti-HER2 therapies, which are ever expanding um, one of the biggest areas of breast cancer medication expansion in recent history. Um, I often get asked about what is a triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative breast cancer means that that cancer does not have estrogen receptor, does not have a progesterone receptor, and is HER2 negative. So depending on the thresholds that are used to define ERPR positivity and the methods for HER2 testing, it accounts for about 10 to 17% of all breast carcinomas. They can be more aggressive than other molecular subtypes. It doesn't mean that they can't be cured. They are and readily cured every day. And the majority are grade three um, or high grade cancers. The other important testing that we do um, that's important to note is every woman with metastatic breast cancer should have ge genetic testing because BRCA or PALB2 mutations predict for really good responses to PARP inhibitors. Even if you don't have a family history, if a woman develops distant disease, she should make sure that she has um, BRCA and PALB2 testing. So if you get a big panel um, with our genetic, uh, any genetic team that will be available to you. Um, because the PARP inhibitors can work particularly well um, with those with mutations. In triple negative breast cancer, we order PDL1 testing to look and see if immunotherapy may be a possibility for an individual, and those can be beneficial. 
It's also important to try to do genomic assessment from its mutations in the tumor because that can elucidate some potential treatments. It's best to do it on a sample of tumor tissue from a distant site, if you can. Sometimes we get such scant sample and or so many people have bony disease alone and the sample from that site may not be very good. And then we can do something called a liquid biopsy. That can also give us some information on mutations. It's just a little less good than doing it on the tumor tissue itself. And this is what this kind of um, report looks like. This is a jama or prostate cancer. Um, but you see the therapeutic implications showing up there. This individual has a BRCA2 mutation. And at least at this time, it was not approved. But the uh, potential therapies are listed there that might be helpful given these mutations. So this can be an important test to get done just to help elucidate if there's anything that's not standard that might be helpful. Um, breast medicine for breast cancer patients, as already been mentioned tonight, are unlikely to be cured, keeping in mind that our old definition of cure was five-year survival. And many, many people are doing much, much better than that. And that was just a randomly picked number in the early days of oncology. Um, in the U.S., about 6% of cases present a stage four diagnosis, as I mentioned. At least a quarter of the patients are alive at five years or longer, and we are getting better at overall survival every day. And pa our patients are living longer with better quality of life due to newer treatments. So when we treat metastatic breast cancer, there's a variety of considerations. Our goals of treatment are to both palliate symptoms and try to increase the quality of life as well as prolonging survival. Um, when we can get a good response that's usually associated with symptom improvement, we make decisions based on the previous therapy a patient has had and their disease-free interval, how long it was from the time of their initial treatment to when their cancer recurred often predicts to how they respond to additional therapy. Um, we look at tumor biology, as I mentioned, including BRCA mutations. And we have to really think about understanding the medical and social issues um, that a patient faces when he or she comes in for treatment. So some of these are comorbidities or other medical conditions that will affect our ability to choose treatments. One of the big ones that I see are people with diabetes. If they have peripheral neuropathy that's pre-existing, that can really complicate our therapy because a lot of the chemotherapies that we give do cause that um, and cause it more frequently in individuals with neuropathy. Um, and I am starting a geriatric oncology breast clinic at Russell where we'll see um, patients over the age of 70 in particular, and use a variety of geriatric assessment tools to really look at their function and more their chronological age and try to learn what therapies might fit best for people with different clusters of symptoms and issues moving forward to help preserve the very best quality of life. Um, convenience is important. There are so many patients that have to travel so far to get treatment. I saw somebody today that comes four hours every time she comes, and it's really, really difficult. Um, some people are able to be better compliant or adherent with some therapies versus others. Some people do better with oral medicine. Some people prefer injectable or IV because they don't have to think about it every day. So trying to figure out what helps a patient get the best treatment is important. And we always have to think about the side effects of our medicines that can affect the normal function of any individual. These are not, we try hard, but they're not all easy therapies. There's a lot of therapies that even though they're new and can be exciting, the side effects can be um, very difficult to manage. This just, it's just a diagram. When, when we think about treating um, this disease as oncologists, we're constantly bouncing back and forth from is the patient sensitive to hormone therapy? Is she not? Should we use this chemotherapy first line? Then we can go back to another endocrine therapy. Then we can go back to a chemotherapy. We're going to move in immunotherapy. And many of the patients are treated for years and we're constantly going up and down these pathways and signals and trying to get the best possible outcome. Um, when we watch patients who have metastatic breast cancer, we do a periodic assessment by their symptoms, physical examination, routine laboratory tests, imaging studies, such as a CT scan and bone scan and or PET scan, and possibly biomarkers. We classify responses like responsive disease, stable disease, or progression of disease. And sometimes the information that we get from any group of tests can be pretty contradictory and hard to figure out. Um, so it's important to have a good relationship with your oncologist to 
work with them and sometimes everybody has to take a deep breath because the radiologist will read something out that's not in fact the case when it's looked at with somebody that has more clinical knowledge of the disease and of the individual that we're treating. Um, we look for signs of progression of disease when we're monitoring patients. If their metastases are increasing or they have new metastases, sometimes this can be obvious. But there is a phenomenon that everybody should be aware of. I just saw a second opinion from out of town the other day where this happened. There's something called flare phenomenon. This generally happens with first line therapy, but sometimes can happen more deeply. On occasion, especially with estrogen receptor positive disease, when women or men have a great response to therapy, their cancer will look worse before it looks better. Uh, because the bone, when it heals, it, the lesions become more sclerotic or more dense. They can show up all of a sudden on a bone scan, places that you didn't see them before on a CT scan. Um, and sometimes tumor markers can even go up in that instance. So it's really important to take all the clinical information before the therapy is abandoned, particularly when it's early on um, in a woman's advanced treatment. This is an example of where we might use local therapy to try to help with breast cancer. Breast cancer, is, I see this every day, and it probably doesn't project very well, but breast cancer is one of the diseases that you can ignore um, for a while if you are frightened of doctors and frightened of medicine. So it's not, un not that unusual in my practice to see people who come in with very advanced tumors because they've been scared to come in. And our goal in treating these individuals is to try to get their cancer under good enough control so that we might be able to clean up the chest wall and give them a better quality of life. But that's really an exception. Um, the studies have been shown that adding local regional treatments such as surgery, mastectomy, um, treating the axilla surgically doesn't change outcome in individuals that have distant disease most of the time, unless you can't control that area. Um, and there were actually really good um, randomized trials that looked at this question women were randomized to have breast cancer surgery or no breast cancer surgery in the setting of stage four disease. And there was no difference um, in overall survival. So we only do local regional control of the breast and the armpit when we, have, don't, when we can't achieve control with our systemic therapies and that's the only site that's progressing. It's not a routine treatment. And they, I, everybody has a feeling that they really want to get that tumor removed and I understand that, but it's, it doesn't help and sometimes it can hurt. Um, because during the time that you're healing or going through the surgery, um, you're not able to take other treatment. So how do clinical trials fit into the equation? I just always think it's important to emphasize that almost every drug that we have in practice, we learned about through a clinical trial. It's important to ask your doctors about potential participation or investigate yourself. We don't have every clinical trial at Roswell that's available throughout the country. It's often extremely difficult to travel for a clinical trial, and I wouldn't have people you know, do it unless there was something very promising and very targeted. Um, but it's just important to know that most patients do better, not worse, as a result of participation in a clinical trial. Often when I present a clinical trial to anybody, the first thing I get is sort of this look of huge skepticism, and sometimes I think fear. Um, it adds a different dimension to discuss for certain, but it's really important to consider them seriously because they can really help outcomes. And the last thing is, if you see the word metastatic on your pathology report or your radiology report, this constant instant online access can cause confusion and anxiety. And sometimes it's real what they're saying and sometimes it's not. So it's just important to remember that metastatic can use, be used to describe cancer involvement of those local regional nodes. And that is still curable disease. Just because you see the word metastatic doesn't mean you have stage four disease. Sometimes people use it just to refer to that noble disease. And so it's important to talk to your doctor to understand diagnosis and prognosis. And again, advanced sometimes means metastatic, but sometimes just means locally advanced. So don't leap to conclusions, just get good information from the horse's mouth, if you will. And I think that's it. Thank you My so much. Um, I <coughs> sit up so I can just so that I'm making sure I'm, uh, the camera can hear me or the people on Zoom. Um, you know, I found that to be really helpful. I also think that um, appreciate that you kept it kind of simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's going to be some questions. I know I have some. 
Um, so if anybody feels comfortable, Rob, if you'll check if there is yeah, any we have two here couple so questions yeah. there, we can start with those if you want. And then if anyone here would like to ask a question of Dr. O'Connor, something that she addressed specifically in her presentation, or perhaps something that she didn't, something you've heard, or, you know, like she said, if you have a question about um, treatment yourself. Um, but yeah, I also think that it was really important and um, to touch on the fact that kind of what Teresa was saying about words matter. I think you made that very clear too with advanced mm -hmm. versus then static that sometimes they're used interchangeably, but they can actually <clears throat> have differential meanings. I know in the UK, it seems that, I don't know if this is Europe abroad, but in the UK at least, and I, and I think Australia, um, you often hear the term secondary uh, breast cancer when they're talking about a, uh, a metastatic diagnosis. So that, that took me a little bit to learn as I was getting involved online in the community, but um, I find that one helpful too because I know it's always what they mean when they're talking about it. Um, so Rob, do you want to? Yeah, um, here's a couple here, um, Dr. O'Connor. What are the symptoms of recurring breast cancer in the lymph nodes? Will it affect the neck? That affects the neck? Yeah. Say I it again. Could it affect the neck? Or? Yeah. Um, will it affect the neck? What are the symptoms of recurring breast cancer in the lymph nodes? Will it affect the neck? Okay, it certainly could. Um, it's not the most common place for a recurrence to happen, um, but individuals can recur in the lymph nodes underneath their arms, um, which would still be curable, again, with treatment if that's the only site, so it's important to know that. Same thing if they recur up here in the supraclavicular region. Mm -hmm. Up here in the cervical region, it's a little um, plus minus. Often patients can be treated um, aggressively in that setting, although technically that is a distant site. But the symptoms are generally, you would have palpable lymph nodes, so you would have rock hard um, enlarged nodes that would be palpable in the site. Um, sometimes there can be impingement or pushing on the nerves that travel through an area and that can cause pain or dysfunction um, downstream to that site. Um, and or swelling. Some individuals will have swelling, particularly of a lamp, that may have a recurrence in this. Okay. okay, another question here that came in. Um, what, is the, what is the difference between micrometastatic and metastatic? Okay. So that's size of the metastasis. Micrometastatic disease is something that we talk about when we're treating patients curatively um, in early stage breast cancer. So if a woman or a man has lymph nodes resected, um, if they have very tiny deposits in the lymph nodes, it's termed micrometastatic. And actually those patients behave much more like a lymph node negative patient than a lymph node positive patient. So their disease is not as high risk as one would think saying that word. Yeah. Okay, a couple more here. Um, is life expectancy for stage four metastatic breast cancer the same as other stage four cancers, i.e. Uh, lung and brain? No, we, we do much, much better. We have more, and while there's outstanding responders in every category, because a lot of that's biology of the individual and how that cancer interacts with um, the treatment that's being administered, we have treatments that are targeted uh, both to the estrogen receptor and to HER2. We have immunotherapies that can be helpful um, but in general, breast cancer patients have a better prognosis than many other um, solid tumors. Okay. Um, if you already have MBC and have new progression, do you recommend a new biopsy to uh, confirm the markers have not changed. changed? Yeah. The answer to that is sometimes. I don't biopsy on every progression. Um, a lot of going and usually just don't get that much. Um, bang for your buck, if you will, putting somebody through that. Mm. I really am a firm believer, if you can, at diagnosis. And then if somebody's been on a treatment for a number of years and then progresses, I often will repeat it then um, because I want to make sure that I understand what I'm treating. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends a little bit on the individual and the circumstances. Sure. Okay. Uh, one more in here. How common is it for MBR to spread to the retina? Um, it's, I wouldn't say it's common, um, you know, where I sit, that's what I see. So I see it, I always have a couple of patients who have, who have that problem, um, metastatic breast cancer involving the back of the eye, um, but it's not a common scenario. That's everything that's come in here, here so far, yeah. <laughs> I'll keep an eye on it. 
And what about our what about our in-person group? Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask right now? Yeah. I, I didn't realize that uh, that the bones were so involved with breast cancer mm -hmm. progression because I thought it was my imagination, but I have a lot of bone pain that I've never had before. And I brought it up to my oncologist and he did send me for a scan. I don't remember if it was MRI, CT, I've had so many, but uh, it didn't show anything. But I still have a lot of hip pain and bone pain in my legs. Now, some people are on medicines called aromatase inhibitors. No, I'm not on anything no. anymore. Um, there's also a phenomenon, and again, I don't know if this would apply to you or not, but uh, individuals, I mean, if you're having a lot of trouble with your joints, I would suggest you maybe see a rheumatologist for mm -hmm. workup if there hasn't been an mm -hmm. explanation. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that I see a lot is we put a lot of women into menopause, and menopause itself can cause a lot of joint issues um, for women. But they, it's not something that's commonly thought about, but it's true. Um, but if your oncologist has looked for metastatic disease and you're not on any medicines that would explain your discomfort, then I would talk to them about seeing uh, somebody who do some blood work. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> when um, this refers back to the question about micrometastasis and lymph nodes, mm -hmm. so there's a difference um, between a micrometastasis to a lymph node and lymph node positive disease. Is that I wasn't very clear? Yeah. Right. So a micro, there's when we think about the axilla, mm -hmm. so the under the arm lymph nodes, well, usually part of the initial staging of the breast yeah. cancer. A breast cancer can spread to the lymph nodes underneath the arm in a micrometastatic fashion or a metastatic fashion. The micrometastatic disease is very, very tiny, involving a lymph node. Um, met, frankly, metastatic disease is larger, and they have different prognosis, okay, and often will result in different treatment. Um, but the point was that if you have a micrometastatic lymph node in your axilla, mm -hmm. um, it's certainly it's certainly not the same as having distant metastatic disease. Right. And in fact, your prognosis is usually much more like a lymph node negative patient, even though you have a tiny focus of cancer. So if one is told that she has one positive lymph node, but never hears anything about micrometastasis versus anything else, Typically, I mean, is there a typical, would that typically be um, a micrometastasis? I mean, I know it's involved in the staging, how many positive, right. that's what I've always heard over the years, you know, oh, did you have any positive lymph nodes? Or so and so had one or three or eight or whatever. And in general, when we talk about lymph node positive disease, we're talking about macrometastasis, the larger mm -hmm. ones, more than micrometastasis. And does that typically mean like more than one lymph node, though, or not? The number doesn't mean really that. It, the number does matter because I mean, I know as far as staging, it matters, yeah. but, yeah. but it also matters in terms of treatment. So, mm -hmm. if there's a patient with um, the, the more macro lymph nodes you have, the higher the risk of mm -hmm. potential recurrence. Um, in individuals that have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, if there's between one and three lymph nodes, mm -hmm. in certain individuals, if we could do additional testing, like a mammoprint or an oncotype, some of those individuals can be spared chemotherapy. Um, depending on the gene signature. Mm -hmm. um, so the number matters in the sense not only of staging, but often um, the treatment that we recommend very permissible. Any questions? Yeah. yeah. If someone is in third stage, you know, <laughs> um, and you're always worried about going to the court, which happens to my mom, oh. and then that's how she passed. Um, I'm always worried about and always asking questions to the oncologist. What do you look for? Because mm -hmm. I have that, you know, time, I'm on that, whatever you said, aromatase inhibitor mm -hmm. and semestine. I think yeah. I really got sick. But when I weigh the two, do I want cancer? Do I want bone pain? I'd rather have just bone pain, so mm -hmm. I deal with it. But what is like a good test? Like, would it be a PET scan? Would it be? This is one of the most difficult conversations to have in breast cancer, but I'll yeah. just have it. Um, <laughs> I have it a lot during the, during the work day. It makes intuitive sense to everyone that we should, that more is better. So we should be doing a lot of surveillance testing and the follow up of breast cancer patients. Um, either a PET scan every six months or CAT scans or bone scans. 
But in fact, none of that has ever been shown to benefit an individual. And you can have perfectly negative scans and three months later have widely disseminated disease. So the follow-up of breast cancer is really a high touch, low tech approach where we monitor the breast for recurrence because that we can, could be a potential curative intervention. And hopefully are eliciting a lot of symptoms and issues. And what I tell all of my patients is I have a, I don't order routine surveillance scans because it's not indicated, but I have a very low threshold to order a test to look to see if you have a symptom to make sure that it's not related to your history of breast cancer. Um, so just, I think having good communication and I know it's hard when you have a chronic problem, yeah. But when you have a chronic problem and it's been looked at, it's not metastatic. Now you know this is your baseline. So what you're looking for is a change from that baseline. Okay, because that's what I was told yeah. for my um, breast cancer doctor. She said, look for a change. And I yeah. said, change where? I got something going wrong every day. I need mean, what change am I looking for? So <laughs> I keep pushing the PET scans and the MRIs and everything. The oncologist says, no, you don't need to keep doing that. And I said, well, my back hurts a lot. But if you don't have a reason for it, then yeah, they said they'll look, you know. But I well, don't, you, you I don't must, want to. Make, you need to get treated for your back pain. Yeah, I have, um, they found, I have uh, recurniated this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I deal with that. But right. there's other things that happen with the hip and going down the hip. And I couldn't walk for about four months and it got better. You know, I had cortisone shots. And so we're, right now it's looking like it's all, everything else, okay? Yeah. But I have the fear every day, every single minute of the day. I live with it all the time. I'm thinking, because I'm close, I'm getting closer to retirement. Should I even worry about retirement? Because maybe I want to make retirement. I mean, I got this fear, you know, because I saw what would happen with my mom, right. you know? And um, I think learning how to live with that is a hard, um, hard thing. I mean, I think you have to get as much support as you can, but I can't act like it's an easy thing for somebody to have. But she got it to work in her eye mm -hmm. and then it went in her bones and it, it, was, it was hard. And then we thought at the end that we thought she was just going to the hospital for a flu. That's what we thought and then 40 years later she was gone. So um, like I said, I live with the fear and they just keep asking the doctors, what test can you take to make sure I don't have it? What test? So the problem, and I'm sure they told you you can do all of those tests on a Monday and five Mondays later, not look very smart. So I think that, and it, unfortunately you can't, as people say, well, what's the harm? But there can be harm because not only false positives, but going through biopsies and don't end up being anything or exposure to radiation. radiation and yeah. and, um, so basically it's just if I notice something really majorly wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, so I think, you know, that you have a baseline back issue and you know what your, your pain is and I would work to manage that. And if you notice a change, I would not hesitate to report it. And I think, you know, with an individual with your history, your doctor should have a low threshold for mm -hmm. looking if you have a problem. Right. Um, but you're also not, you know, damned to have a recurrence. No. I mean, there are many, many patients who have more um, stage three disease that do very, very well and never have a recurrence. So, I, learning how to live with that uncertainty, I think, is one of the great challenges that patients face. And I'm in awe every day of how people, you know, like Teresa, live their lives, whether or not they have stage four disease, because it, it means changing a mindset right. into, you know, embracing the day and finding a way to cope with the uh, uncertainty. Yeah, my daughter is a hard thing. Like that if I say something is bothering me, you know, I think it's kind of cancer. Um, would you stop? You know, they try to get you back into get rid of that thought and get this yeah. thought. You know, it's a cold, it's a this. It's good to talk that. to people too. Like, that's why, like, the Breast Cancer Network has support groups available. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that support, like, there's, there's an older culture of, like, oh, think positive, yeah. but then there's toxic positivity too. Right. And it's actually quite healing to actually deal with your emotions and deal with your fears. And, Get them out because then you get it's like releasing the demons that you need to do that sometimes. So yeah, I like you know, Judy I like leads a really nice here. group here, and um, we have a group that meets on oh, I know. once a week on, or once a month on Wednesdays too. And there's a lot of there's a lot of support available that can be really helpful. I need that. I mean, I almost again didn't come today because I had something else really bad. But anyway, I said I need to be here. 
and I just keep these posts. Yeah. And I and we're talking. It just you know, it just made me feel like you care yourself, you know. I mean with even eating and stuff like that, just kind of saying, ah, who cares, you know, who knows, you know, maybe it's another year, maybe I won't even make retirement. I'm like, that's a stupid thought process. You know, I used to always be so positive. Um, but it's just the fear, I think, the fear that I just want to know. Like, take a test every week. I want to know. I want to know. Yeah. Well, and I, I'd like to offer that, you know, obviously we have that, so that we know you're, you know, taking taking advantage of, of the support here, but there are um, there are a lot of mental health and and because that is a mental health thing yeah, and we and you're not alone. We all face that um, whether it's living with an earlier stage breast cancer and wondering about that fear of occurrence or all the other things that can go wrong in our bodies. And um, I know the, Dr. O'Connor mentioned uh, the survivorship clinic at Roswell. I don't know if that's where you where you're treated. I but, started there. I yeah. started there and I was seeing someone and she was great. And then she said she was leaving. Oh, um, there's somebody so, new. And but that's what I said. Put me on a list. And I've been on a yeah. list for like six months. Okay. And nobody's following. Yeah. Me. But well, I guess I don't. Call. Yeah, and don't give up on that. You can always check back in. But you know, finding finding someone to talk to is important. Um, I also think one thing I wanted to ask and kind of bring up for the group. You mentioned um, things like eating and lifestyle. Um, I try to look at this basically lifestyle stuff as what can I do just feel good, right? More than say specifically to reduce for risk of recurrence or all that. But it's always a good idea to know, are there things that we, as people who, you know, need to take this into consideration, are there things that we can do for ourselves that are good for us that can, that, that are there studies that show like exercise, sure. reducing alcohol, some of those different things that we know. Well, you know, I'm Irish, so. I know, <laughs> well, I, 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 so yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. I know the data, I mean, there's not, it's, there's not this good data in the metastatic setting that any of these things make a difference in that outcome, but in the, in the early stage setting, um, healthy lifestyle changes, keeping a very healthy weight, um, limiting alcohol, all of these things are important um, in terms of, I don't, I would never say that you are not allowed to have a glass of wine ever, right? Mm -hmm. um, but being a little mindful about it um, can help uh, in terms of prognosis. So, could you ask one more and I'll be fine? Yeah, it's okay. Um, <laughs> this is tough forever. Um, that medication I talked about, that XMS thing mm -hmm. that we talked about, uh, the first my college to lunch and said, you can be on it for five years, and then said, and no more. And I said, no, that's, I don't want to, uh, I got to be on it longer. And he goes, no, he says, because it has a lot of side effects. And I said, but then what do I take after? And he said, nothing. I said, so so for somebody I, like you should be on it. Yeah, I've really been on it six now. Yeah. And I've got to know, I think my college just put that one retired. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, Pat. Yeah. So then past 10, you just don't do nothing. I think what I'm not saying don't do nothing. Yeah, yeah, you know, it, it depends on the patient. So usually, if, if anything, people are on these medicines too long because mm -hmm. their risks are not that high. There's there's various calculators that we can use at around year five as well as genomic testing to help determine how long a patient should be on these therapies. You're telling me you have stage three, mm -hmm. um, which is you know a riskier scenario as you expressed. Um, and with patients that have a large nodal burden, I negotiate with each individual. So, you know, I'm not going to make anybody stop anything right at 10 years if that's not you know, what we, we both think is reasonable. Yeah. I feel yeah. comfortable with still staying on it, so I feel that. Still you know, other people have to come off because of side effects, or mm -hmm. other people can't wait to get off. So everybody's a little bit different in how they approach this, but it's really just a negotiation and discussion. Well, I feel better. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question about age. Yeah. Um, what different ages are you seeing for that for metastatic disease? Is that the range and like what's the average? Well, I would say I don't know that I know these statistics off the top of my head, but I would say the you know breast cancer, like all diseases, is more common the older we get. Uh, as a woman oncologist, my own practice skews skews younger. Um, even though I have this interest in insurance, which is very funny. So I see a lot of women in their 30s and 50s. Not, not a lot in terms of a population number, but in terms of my clinical mm -hmm. number. Um, there's a lot, there are women very young with my stomach breast cancer. I'm just trying to figure out like why that is because I've been 
I mean, obviously, want my friends to know that I am working with the hypothetic disease. I'm kind of like the person they refer other people to. Mm -hmm. And there's just so many more people, like within the past few years, that are getting connected to me that are in their 30s and 40s. I know the number is up a little bit, but it's not up like gangbuster. So I suspect it may have to do something with your connectivity um, and you know people recognizing you as a resource and um, reaching out uh, because the numbers haven't. You know, there was a trend up, but it's not a huge trend. Dr. Um, just as a follow-up to what Amy was saying, so when you said about your lifestyle, um, more. Did you say it's more important um, when you get early stage disease? So the data are not as strong in metastatic disease. Okay. I mean, certainly I'm not going to discourage anybody from eating healthily and right. keeping a healthy weight and right. exercising right. and limiting alcohol. All of those things are things that I should be doing too. And I don't know if it makes sense. Um, but the data are strongest in um, helping to help reduce, reduce recurrence. Because recur yeah. that's what we heard, I know. Yeah. Button, so you can still say yes, absolutely. Um, so in the in the what well, I would say in the community at large, and when I say that, I'm talking about the people I encounter online because I'm pretty active in, in the breast cancer space, um, like on some different social media. Obviously, that's a pool of people who are there, but um, you know, there's been a statistic around, or, or a, I don't know if it's an actual statistic, but there's a number that floats around that basically says that one in three women who are diagnosed with an early stage breast cancer, meaning one, two, or three, will face a metastatic recurrence at some point. And I know that's an older number, but I also get the impression that's still a current number, and I'm curious to know what you mean. There are really, really good calculators that could give everybody a much more granular idea yeah. of risk. And sometimes I think it's important to to do these calculators with your doctor if you're interested. Some people prefer not to know. Sure. But sometimes individuals think they're at gaspingly high risk of recurrence. And when we go over those numbers, they're like, wow. Yeah. If you don't focus on the recurrence number, if you focus on the cure number, often, even though you have many positive lymph nodes, your cure number is actually still pretty high. Um, so sometimes just getting that granular detail is important in terms of parsing out what your own risk is as an individual. If there are things that are out there, they should be able to be done with anyone. Okay. So now, as a follow up to that, when I, I was diagnosed um, 17 years ago mm -hmm. uh, with her two positive, we did have one positive lymph node. But I was told when I was diagnosed that breast cancer is never considered here, and yet you're talking about here. No, breast cancer is here. I think they were being unnecessarily well, negative. Because, you know, it's just because breast cancer, unlike other breast cancers, can always come back. That's what I was thinking. There's a number of cancers that have that mm -hmm. ability. Um, and some breast cancers do, and a lot of them don't. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, it's not a blanket statement. It doesn't mean that just because you're diagnosed with a one lymph node positive breast cancer that you can't ever take a deep breath and think it's really unlikely. Well, yeah. You know, I mean, it's I, really I, unlikely you're going to have a problem. And I, you know, and I have yeah. just, I had her check. I had her two positive, but I, and I had the discussion with my um, oncologist. I don't say the only thing that she said or yeah. whoever said when back then. But so you can be considered pure and still end up with metastatic yeah. disease, but you can consider yourself pure yeah. when you are not because it was always well, you're living with no evidence of disease, not necessarily from him. Just that was a term that was. I mean, we use that too, but I don't. I don't mm -hmm. think it's a bad thing to mm -hmm. tell people that they're likely to do when it's true. Mm -hmm. Is there? Yeah. I did. I know I was diagnosed longer ago than Kathy, but at some point, long after treatment had finished, I still thought of myself as having breast cancer. But that eventually changed. I mean, I don't consider myself to have it. Do you know that? Right. It's well, stable good. with that. You know. I think that's again an important distinction about mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. and that that's to some extent that's a choice that we each make the language we use some people aren't comfortable saying cured and some people will say i'm in permission or i live with no evidence of disease uh just like Teresa said you know mm -hmm. she considers herself living with breast cancer mm -hmm. um other people you know use right. words like drivers and survivors and kind of these designations but i think it's a lot of what 
um, how it makes it most true to you and how you talk about it and how you feel it because I think, I think a lot if of you have your, really good statistics you oh yeah. yeah 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 absolutely <laughs> there are people have really good statistics yeah absolutely and that, that unfortunately not everybody yeah uh, I mean I like the, the living with um, deceased and it's a very thoughtful thing I'm not trying to minimize it but for right. somebody who really has that early stage of breast cancer oh sure absolutely yeah like right. being able to consider yourself <clears throat> cured if that's if that's what the statistics show and that's what feels right to you, then claim that, you know, and that's what you get to get to offer. Any other questions for Dr. O'Connor before we wrap up? I have a question about treatments. Yeah. So once you progress to being on IV chemotherapy treatments, can you talk a little bit about the options that are available, like starting with Staxel and like what would come next? Sure. So um, not knowing, you know, the history, we often in first line for estrogen receptor positive disease, we use, I tend to use Cape Cytidine first line because it's oral and they're not mm -hmm. tied to a chemotherapy chair. Taxol um, is a common agent when we switch to IV chemotherapy. There are many other approved agents. Uh, Arribulin, uh, if a woman's not had an anthracycline, often we'll use Doxel. Um, there's Gemcitidine, Carboplatin, Navalbine, Ixabethalon. I mean, honestly, there, it, you rarely run out of uh, chemotherapy agents. It's always a question of performance status, side effects, how mm -hmm. the whole picture is done. There's an interesting drug that's approved in triple negative breast cancer called sasituzumab that binds to the um, troponin uh, receptor, the trope one receptor, and actually delivers the payload of chemotherapy into the cell. And there's some very interesting data emerging in estrogen receptor positive patients for that medicine. I would not be surprised to see that get approved uh, shortly. So there's lots of new things coming down the pipeline. Um, so I'm hopeful that there'll be good options. And the other thing to remember is, you know, some of these new oral therapies are actually tougher than traditional chemotherapies. Uh, but when those new oral therapies become available, particularly if they target a mutation, um, it's worthwhile finding the opportunity to try them. Um, and in the past year, you know, there's been Helicip, which can be a very tough drug. Um, yeah. There's many other uh, anti-estrogen therapies that are going to become available in the next couple of years, I think. I did a trial with lasofoxifene. Um, there's other, there's elastotran. I mean, there's a lot of um, medication in the pipeline. So it might give you an opportunity to get off of chemotherapy again in the future. So my last question would be like, if I'm already seeing someone at Roswell, would it be up to me to ask for clinical trials or would my, or would I assume that my oncologist would be recommending it? Your oncologist. Okay. Recommend it yeah. It's not a bad, you know, it's always, because clinics are busy, you know this. Um, so when your cancer progresses, it's never a bad question to ask, is there a clinical trial for me right now? Um, because it's worthwhile considering. So I think asking that question, because it brings everybody's head back to thinking that way sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, we may forget about an option um, if it's not at the top of our list. So asking the question is always a good one, but I know Alice would yeah, present it to you. Would there be, are there more um, for, for the uh, stage four? Mm -hmm. Do you have many clinical trials for that? Or no, because it is stage four. No, we have tons of clinical trials on stage four. I mean, tons is a big yeah. word, like I said, but we do have them. <laughs> uh, just like, and actually right now, I think we have more in the stage four portfolio than we have in other stages. Yeah. I was looking at it, because you can find it all online. Mm -hmm. There's a lot. You can yeah. watch it there, and it's nice to know that it's right here. I guess mm -hmm. I mean, unfortunate, I only drive four hours, but mm -hmm. another one of your patients has been like 10 minutes down the road. And then wait four hours. I know. I just, I just, I just, that's true. That's true. Um, um, I know they were that. Right. <laughs> I know we're, I know we need to wrap up, but I do have one more question. Um, because this was something I actually had wondered about and um, asked on the phone, and I think you might have corrected me. So we generally uh, anticipate or expect that early detection when it comes to breast cancer in general, right? Early, early stage detection that the sooner you find it um, in its progression means that typically less invasive mm -hmm. and possibly more treatment options and better outcomes, right? Um, 
is that also true for stage four so that for metastases? So if you have, say, you know, a small spot of metastases of a metastatic disease in, a, in the bone versus it's also in your liver and also like, is there a kind of a quote unquote early detection? I know there's not ways to necessarily screen for it. It's no, I mean, really, what you, mostly if you are in a situation where people are responding to symptoms and issues, um, you're really talking about a difference in biology. Okay. So most breast cancers don't recur as a single spot in the spine. If they do, they're biologically very different than those cancers that recur throughout the skeleton. And you can treat them differently, but it's more a reflection of the biology than somebody doing a CT scan every six months with a six-year sure. and follow-up. That was my clarification. Yeah. So. I don't want anybody ignoring a symptom saying it doesn't matter when my metastatic disease is picked up because that's not true. If somebody has a symptom, it needs to be evaluated. Um, but there's not the same kind of early detection model that we have when we're looking at the primary. Sure. Primary. Okay. We're doing a lot of screening and a lot of a lot of workup. Right. But again, it's just important to think about you know, report your symptoms without being crazy. You know, every time we all get aches and pains and all of that's you know very normal. Um, the things that persist that don't go away that are worrisome that are new are important. Any final questions? Let's go ahead and wrap up. We're good here. All right. Yeah. Dr. Pana, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that we have our final June is actually the end of the speaker series for this season, for the 2021-2022 season. Um, we are going to have, we're going to have her last name in my head, COVID Laura. Brain. Laura, thank you. I was thinking Julia. Thank you. Okay. Laura Fisher, um, who is a genetic counselor, and she's going to be talking to us about genetic counseling, genetics in breast cancer, and addressing a little bit with, um, you know, talking about things like different gene mutations, BRCA1, BRCA2, there's always new, seems to be new ones emerging, and she's going to talk about a little bit about what it means to be a previvor um, for those who maybe have a known genetic mutation and haven't been diagnosed with, um, with a cancer yet. So an actual tumor yet. So, um, and then we will be heading into our next season in the fall. So stay tuned. You'll be getting all the information. And we're looking forward to more great speakers next year. Always feel free, um, Rob, myself, Debbie, anyone on the board, if there's a topic you want to hear about, especially like this time of year, because we will be pulling together the upcoming se season. So if there's something, if there's a topic you're really curious about and you want us to repeat, Send me an email, send it, send it to Rob, let us know, you know, if there's something that you're curious about and you want us to um, see if we can find a speaker to explore, we'd love your input. Okay, so thank you very much. And thanks again, Dr. O'Connor, Debbie, yeah, any so, no, final I thoughts? Really, I echo everything that Amy has said. Um, you can even call if you want, call the office if you have any ideas. Also, if you happen to see a doctor or some other type of practitioner that you think would be a good speaker um, on a topic that you're interested in, let us know. Other than that, does anybody have any questions about anything from tonight? Okay, then I just would like to remind you that if you'd like to stay oh, yeah. support her, right. Judy is here and uh, she's in purple, you can let her know. So safe ride home, everybody, and hope to see you next month.